what you're looking at, depending on who you ask, is either a revolution for the internet and countless industries as we know it. Like in all seriousness, I compare it to the internet. Or the greatest Ponzi scheme in human history. The whole thing is a promise that you can get rich for free. Accused of being all of these things is the world of cryptocurrencies or the other labels associated with it. NFTs, blockchains, Web 3.0. From the bizarre onslaught of celebrity promotions and endorsements. I got an ape too. Part of the same oh, community. We're yes. both apes. To the eye-watering numbers and headlines. For digital artist people. The final bid, $69 million. Oh my God. To the grandiose claims about its potential. It's the biggest technology that's ever happened in the history of life. I once described the world of cryptocurrencies as a story. And I did that in hopeful, optimistic tones. And now... Now I don't think it's the story that I initially thought it was. They only make money because some other sucker lost more. Have fun staying poor. It amazes me that anybody is buying into this. They are decentralized Ponzi schemes. The only thing that you have to show is Ponzi schemes. It's, it's all story. bullshit. For me and many others, it began here. What you're looking at is a piece of artwork by a digital artist called Michael Joseph Winkleman, otherwise known as Beeple. On February the 25th of 2021, this artwork was put on auction. Bidding started at $100. It eventually sold for $69.3 million, oh my making it one of the biggest sales in digital art history. That's where I do feel super lucky. What happened afterwards? <laughs> Where do I begin? A digital artwork by a relatively unknown American artist. Sold for nearly 70 million dollars. That's more than most Picassos, Monets, or Warhols. That it doesn't exist in physical form. It is only available digitally. It's the first NFT ever sold at auction. Non-fungible token, NFT. NFTs or non-fungible tokens. Explain NFTs to people that don't know what you're talking about. Because I don't know what you're talking about. It was like suddenly the term NFT was just everywhere. Jack Dorsey, co-founder of Twitter, sells a picture of his first ever tweet as an NFT. Jack Dorsey auctioning his first tweet as digital art. $2.9 million. Even popular internet memes were selling as this NFT thing. Nyan Cat, $590,000. Charlie Bit My Finger, $760,999. Disaster Girl, $500,000. Doge, $4 million. Overly Attached Girlfriend, $411,000. Bad Luck Brian, $36,000. Scumbag Steve, $57,000. You had singer, songwriter Grimes, selling $6 million worth of digital art as NFTs. People were changing their profile pictures on social media to NFTs that they had purchased. It was like flexing an expensive car or a watch. And then suddenly, all these big celebrities and artists and influencers were also replacing their profile pictures with NFTs and announcing their own purchases of NFTs. And the apes, the apes were, were part of this bigger project of NFTs called Board Ape Yacht Club. I mean, you had Snoop Dogg, Eminem, DJ Khaled, Lil Baby, Post Malone, Stephen Curry, Gwyneth Paltrow, to name a few, all of them purchasing these pictures of apes for sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars. And amongst this sea of high ticket sales, you would hear that this is all part of something revolutionary. It's the biggest technology that's ever happened in the history of life outside of things like fire. Regardless of how much you knew about NFTs, there was one message that was really clear. Behind every story, every headline, there was an underlying premise. Something is happening and there is a lot of money to be made. Welcome back to the show and congrats on getting married. Yes, this is a big yeah. deal. The last time you were on the show, I asked you to explain NFTs. So popular talk show host Jimmy Fallon does this segment on his show with Paris Hilton where they show off their pictures of bored apes. This is your, this is your ape. Yeah. That's really cool. Look at the hat, the shades. Part of the same, we're part of the same community. We're yes. both apes. Love it. Uh, here, my ape, this is my ape. Yours is so cool. I love the red hard sunglasses. I love the captain hat. It reminded me of me a little bit. Dude, look at this. They look like they could be friends. They're buddies. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this was the point in which I started to wonder, okay, what is actually happening? And I think a lot of people started to as well you start to realize that the purchase of Beeple's artwork, that wasn't done through $69.3 million in cash. 
that purchase was made using cryptocurrencies. In fact, all the NFT purchases that we were seeing, they, they were done through cryptocurrency. The mysterious individual who purchased Beeple's artwork that went by the pseudonym Metacoven. Turns out it's this guy called Vignesh Sundarisan who is already a cryptocurrency entrepreneur and had a working relationship with Beeple months prior to the big sale. And whilst there was all this talk about the revolutionary potential behind what we're seeing, there was another side of the story that was being painted by people who are far more skeptical. And those voices had a clear warning. What you are witnessing is a mania. We've got this system that is gleefully and gloriously corrupt. A mania that is being driven by greed. Get rich quick by investing in cryptocurrency. Mass delusion. My ape is an inner reflection of myself. Or, as other critics put it, it is a giant scam that has some of the largest names, brands, venture capital firms backing it, knowingly or not. NFTs were just a component of a much bigger machine with a lot of moving pieces. And when you put those pieces together, it creates a machine for one of the greatest scams in human history. And it all begins here, with a mysterious invention and a failed revolution. 2008. That's where this really begins. Apple shares are just getting hammered this morning. We're down by between three and four and a half percent generally. The United States is going through a recession it hasn't seen since the Great Depression. The consumers strangled. They're watching their housing prices go lower. They're watching their 401ks get diminished. You created the mess we're in, and now you're saying, Sorry. Amongst the backdrop of this all, a mysterious individual is working on their own invention. On the 31st of October, they send an email to a cryptography mailing list. The email begins, I've been working on a new electronic cash system that's fully peer-to-peer -peer with no trusted third party. It was signed by somebody under the pseudonym Satoshi Nakamoto. Whoever this Nakamoto person was, they had a vision. The vision was to create a type of currency that existed digitally, that could be controlled by no government or single individual that could be used to transact in globally, no matter where you were or what time it was. The name of this currency and invention? Bitcoin. On January the 3rd, 2009, Nakamoto launches his invention, creating the first ever Bitcoins to exist. It was an attractive pitch, you know, especially to people who held anti-state control sentiments. You know, we're talking about anarchists, techno-anarchists, libertarians, cypherpunks. These were individuals who likely saw the government, the banks, the entire financial institution as just untrustworthy, that they, they can't be allowed to control monetary policy. And it was these factions that became the first adopters of Bitcoin, influencing its early culture. The goal was simple preach the message of Bitcoin to others and increase its adoption. Bitcoin was kind of like a religion of its own, right? Like Satoshi Nakamoto was this Jesus-like figure that would communicate with his disciples on online forums. He would talk of this future vision of the world, you know, one where the dollar no longer existed and all transactions would be made through Bitcoin, the global currency of the people that was owned by no central entity. To those early adopters of Bitcoin, they really felt like they were on the cusp of something revolutionary. It just so happened that the more people started buying into the message, the higher Bitcoin's value rose and the more people were willing to like put real dollars into buying Bitcoins. Bitcoin is now up to $111. Bitcoin started drawing attention from places it probably wasn't expecting or even wanting. The guys in suits, you know, the, the big money, the people who saw Bitcoin as revolutionary, but perhaps more importantly, as an opportunity. The Winklevoss twins were a perfect example of that. I mean, here you have two twins who have graduated from Harvard. They've won a settlement for $65 million against Mark Zuckerberg for stealing their initial idea of Facebook. They found out about Bitcoin on on a holiday trip to Ibiza and they started buying as much as they could. They were stockpiling the currency. It was by around 2013 that they were rumored to own about 1% of all Bitcoin in circulation. That I think was a perfect early warning of what was to come. Bitcoin was doomed from the start. That's what a lot of crypto skeptics will tell you. And I understand why. Relying on computer code and the ideals of tech anarchists probably isn't the best place to entrust a reimagining of the financial system. Bitcoin had a fixed supply of 21 million coins, which makes it deflationary by nature. So if one Bitcoin is worth more tomorrow than it is today, why would you want to use it to transact with? It's a 
pretty bad incentive to have if you're trying to make a global currency. But that is already assuming that Bitcoin had the technical capabilities to become this worldwide currency which it didn't. I mean, Bitcoin had scaling issues thanks to design decisions that Nakamoto themselves had made. It could only process seven transactions per second. I mean, compared to other traditional payment networks like Visa, which can process 1,700 transactions per second, or MasterCard, which handles 5,000 transactions per second. And keeping the Bitcoin network running wasted a lot of energy. Bitcoin aimed to be decentralized, meaning no government or single entity had control over it. But in order to do that, Nakamoto employed what is called a proof of work consensus model. All this meant was that computers on the Bitcoin network would be forced to use real world energy in order to solve algorithmic problems. And whichever computer solved the problem first would be rewarded with more Bitcoins. It was a process called mining. And that process is insanely wasteful of energy. And what ends up happening? Proof of work incentivized this arms race between computers on the Bitcoin network, all of them looking to build more and more powerful computers to have a better chance of mining Bitcoin. And the more powerful those computers grew, the more real world energy they ended up taking, despite the fact that the transactions per second remained the same. Most Bitcoin mining done today is done by huge mining farms in warehouses. Bitcoin, for the most part, failed in its objective of trying to become a global currency. Outside of illegal use purposes, Bitcoin just wasn't being used to transact with. So the obvious question becomes, how? How is it that despite its failings, Bitcoin still survived and is very much present to this day? But that's just the thing. The Bitcoin that we see today is a shell of its former identity, where most of the purchasing of Bitcoin today happens on centralized exchanges that have to comply with the laws of centralized institutions. In the instances where you've heard about Bitcoin, or if you've ever been encouraged to buy Bitcoin, under what context is that always framed? By 2014, the mysterious Satoshi Nakamoto effectively vanished from the internet and hasn't been heard from since. What was left of his invention was no longer a currency, it was something entirely different. Bernie Madoff. This was a guy who was well respected on Wall Street. He ran a brokerage firm with a wealth management branch. He had many clients investing with his firm under the promise of great returns on their money until... The FBI arrested him this morning after he told senior employees yesterday that his business was a giant Ponzi scheme. Madoff had been running the largest Ponzi scheme in history for the last 17 years and potentially longer, worth around $64.8 billion. He would essentially put his investors' money inside a bank account and then simply pay out early investors with the money that new investors were giving. Now Madoff eventually pleaded guilty and he was in prison up until his death in 2021. That is the essence of any Ponzi scheme. People invest into the scheme under this promise that they're going to make a great amount of returns and then early investors are paid using the money of new investors. And this process is repeated on and on until eventually you run out of new recruits to keep investing money into the scheme or eventually people start trying to cash out and it just collapses, which tends to leave early investors with profits and the large majority of others with nothing but losses. People hearing about Bitcoin would hear about two things. One, that it was revolutionary. And two, that it was valuable. That if you buy now, you could be rich later. If you really, really want to become wealthy in the future, I would suggest you take one freaking dollar, buy some Bitcoin. Bitcoin to me, it's not just an investment. Um, it's not just a maybe a get rich quick scheme as a lot of people put it, but I see it as the future of currency. I see it as the future of the financial system. So you realize that most of the people buying Bitcoin, they're not buying it to use as a currency. They're buying it as an investment. And therein lies the contradiction. Because the more people who used Bitcoin like an investment, the less liable Bitcoin became as a currency, the very thing it's being pitched as being revolutionary as. So you know what you end up with, right? Bitcoin is a get rich quick scheme. The promise is you can get rich for free. Magical internet money. Anyone who buys into the idea of Bitcoin is doing so to sell it for a higher price at a future date. And the people that buy it off those people are also looking to sell it for a higher price at a future date. The only way to make money from your Bitcoin investment is using the money of new investors. You hear about people making money in Bitcoin. They only make money because some other sucker lost more. 
And unlike Bernie Madoff, right, who gets all the blame and the satisfying jail time at the end of his story, here you have an entity that isn't owned by anyone. What some would argue isn't a decentralized currency. It's a decentralized Ponzi scheme. Now, Ponzi schemes are kept alive by continuously finding new recruits and new markets to tap into so that money is continuously being poured into the scheme. And so you start to see this similar incentive develop in the crypto space, this desperate need to find a use case for this stuff. And that use case has to be revolutionary enough to justify its rising value. Bitcoin may have been the first part of this machine, but things were about to get a whole lot more interesting. Bitcoin had something going for it. The blockchain system that kept it running was somewhat unique. Okay, so let's not complicate things, right? You can think of Bitcoin like a digital spreadsheet that records transactions being used in the currency. It's not a physical coin, it's just data on a database. After a certain number of transactions are made, a brand new spreadsheet is created that links to the previous one and on and on and on it goes. Instead of using real names, users are recognized through what are called wallet addresses, which appear as a random string of numbers and letters. And all of this is kind of kept together using computer code, cryptography, and the network of miners that are running it, which is where the word cryptocurrency comes from. So what was essentially just an immutable append-only database was touted as revolutionary. You know, blockchain was no longer just blockchain, it was blockchain technology. And it wasn't long before people started to see the success and the ideals that Bitcoin was based off and begin creating their own cryptocurrencies using this blockchain system. Vitalik Buterin a teenager who decided to quit his favorite video game, World of Warcraft, after his Warlock character had a damage component removed by the game developers. Vitalik says that he cried himself to sleep that night. That was the day that he realized the horrors that centralized services bring. It sounds a bit ridiculous, but Vitalik would end up discovering Bitcoin in 2011 and he would start writing for a Bitcoin magazine. It all appealed to his ideals. In 2015, Vitalik and several other co-founders launched the creation of their own blockchain-based invention. It was called Ethereum. Much like Bitcoin, Ethereum had its own blockchain and it had its own native currency, which was called Ether. There was one important difference though. You see, Ethereum allowed its users to actually program applications on its blockchain. Put it this way, if Bitcoin was like a spreadsheet, then Ethereum was like an Excel spreadsheet that allowed users to create functions to perform various different tasks. It was, you know, a little more advanced. It was a glimpse of hope at finding the revolutionary use cases in the cryptocurrency world needed in order to justify the growing value that was being pumped into the system. So, <laughs> What was the first thing that people started using Ethereum for? Creating more cryptocurrencies. And today we will be creating our own cryptocurrency in under 10 or maybe even under 5 minutes. Rather than needing to create your own blockchain and network, you could just use Ethereum's blockchain to create your own cryptocurrencies or crypto assets as people called them. These assets that existed without their own native blockchain were called tokens. There are now over 1500 cryptocurrencies. It became known as the ICO mania. It was supposed to be this new way to fund your business. Businesses could create their own token coins, release what is called a white paper, which explains what the project aimed to do, and then they could sell those tokens to the public, otherwise known as an initial coin offering, ICO. A whole wave of these token coins were being released. Uh, some of them parodies and others were just blatant scams. Titcoin. The Whopper coin. Trump coin. Kodak coin. Insane coin. But here it is, so I created Dictator coin. Jesus coin was a token coin that was promising to decentralize Jesus on the blockchain. On its white paper, its creators stated they were in early talks with churches to provide miracles exclusively to Jesus coin owners. Ponzi coin was very much open about the fact that it was a scam. Their website literally said it right there is as much as a scam as 99% of the ICOs out there, but it's more transparent about it. Ponzi coin still managed to raise $250,000. It didn't matter if the idea was good enough or not, or if it even solved the problems it was claiming to solve. All that mattered was that people believed in the token enough so that the value would rise and it would pay off the early investors who got in at the start. There was one that you invested in that saw like 2000% growth last month. Yep. What was uh, it? That was Denver coin. ICOs also marked the beginning of an unlikely friendship between those in the cryptocurrency space and influencers and celebrities. If token coins were fueled by hype and attention. 
then celebrities and influencers were the ones that were running the gas stations. Famous professional boxer Floyd Mayweather, along with producer DJ Khaled, were paid $100,000 and $50,000 respectively to promote the token coin Centratech in 2017. Centratech was a project that was promising to deliver financial services to the cryptocurrency world. The coin had raised $32 million. Turns out they lied about their CEO, who wasn't even a real person that existed. They lied about business deals with MasterCard and Visa, and its co-founder, Sam Sharma, was eventually sentenced to eight years in prison. ICOs effectively became a casino to gamble unregistered securities. But you have to remember the hidden incentives. No matter how fraudulent or bizarre everything looks on the outside in the crypto world, you have to keep clutching at potential use cases or anything that will justify its value constantly rising to new investors. And whilst the ICO mania of 2017 was continuing, a whole new idea was coming to fruition. So how many of y'all have heard of this new game that came out recently? I don't know how you, how, how do we actually describe what these things are? And today we're talking about CryptoKitties. CryptoKitties was probably one of the first NFT projects to make it into the spotlight. CryptoKitties. CryptoKitties. It's a viral blockchain based game that sparked a global craze for virtual cats. It's a picture of a cat. You logged onto the site, you created an account that was connected to your crypto wallet, and you'd play this game in which you would collect, breed, and sell virtual cats for cryptocurrency. Currency. The key pitch here though is that every cat is its own unique token that exists on the Ethereum blockchain, making them what you would essentially call non-fungible, or as they're often called now, a non-fungible token, an NFT. Think of it like a digital beanie babies. Now if that sounds a little weird, it's because it is. CryptoKitties became like its own mania. It generated $3 million within its first week of launch and accounted for roughly 10 to 13% of all traffic on Ethereum's network. And where was everyone's focus during that mania? Okay, that's $2,700 for this little guy. Why use these CryptoKitties? $450,000 for this ugly mug. The same reason you started out with the cryptocurrency to make money. Guys, this is a potential way to make some money. This is insane. Most users are trying to breed their cats at the moment, not just because it's kind of cool, but also because they can be very expensive. There are thousands of people playing on the CryptoKitties website. Once everyone started rushing to join in on the hype, the economics of the game began to falter as the supply of CryptoKitties stretched far beyond the demand, eventually leading to a crash in the price of CryptoKitties and a fall in average users. Because as you continue to see time and time again, almost everyone was there to make money. But what remained of that saga was the idea of non-fungible assets. A brand new package, a brand new pitch, a new route to find use cases for cryptocurrencies and blockchain technology. This stuff was initially pitched to digital artists. The idea was that you would make artwork, then tokenize that artwork, which just means turning it into a token that exists on a blockchain like Ethereum. If you wanted to know who owned the artwork, all you had to do was just go and check the blockchain records and see which wallet was associated with the artwork. In theory, you could digitally verify the ownership of your art. Sounds exciting, you might think. I did too. Digital artist Michael Winkleman, otherwise known as Beeple, began a challenge in 2007 where he would create one piece of artwork every single day and continue to do so throughout the years. It was known as his Everydays collection. But to me, the bigger project is this long-term Everydays project, which is a project that I've been working on, you know, every single day for over 12 years. It was reportedly around October of 2020 when Beeple was put in touch with an anonymous NFT artist called Pack, and Pack informed Beeple about the world of NFTs. Only a few months later, he would end up auctioning a piece of artwork that contained a collage of the first 5,000 images of the Everyday series, titled Everyday's The First 5,000 Days. $69.3 million was how much it sold for in the Ether cryptocurrency, one of the largest sales in digital art history. The very sale that sent the search term NFT skyrocketing. So now the question becomes, who decided to make that purchase? So you purchased a collection of 5,000 pieces of digital art that anyone can easily see online for $69 million. Why did you do that? Metacoven, or as they were later revealed to be, Vignesh Sundarisan, a crypto entrepreneur who had recently co-founded a crypto investment firm with his business partner called Metapurse. 
Only a few months before this big $69 million purchase, Meta Coven and his business partner had already bought another collection of NFTs from Beeple for over $2.2 million. They actually wrote a blog post about their purchase, alluding to the fact that this was only part of a much bigger project that they had in mind that will quote, flip the art world status quo on its head. And what was that project that they were talking about? The B20 token coin. They were going to bundle their purchases of Beeple's NFTs collection and put it in a virtual museum where those who purchased the B20 token coin could access and view the artwork. Owning the B20 token was supposed to represent a type of fractional ownership in the virtual museum and the contents inside of it. Here's the thing. Meta Coven and his business partner conveniently owned 59% of the total supply of B20 tokens. Beeple was also given 2% of that supply. Beeple and Meta Coven already had a working relationship before the big Everyday's 5000 sale. When that sale happened and the media frenzy ensued, the B20 token rose in value to $23 as more people began obviously looking into who Metacoven was. People have accused that sale of essentially being a giant marketing stunt to increase the value of the B20 token. Even in their calls together, you can hear people express skepticism around the whole thing, only for Metacoven and the others to kind of bring him around. Other artists, I can almost guarantee will not like this. Like they will not like you taking their work and like splitting it into a million pieces and reselling those pieces. I that I would be very surprised if other artists did not have a, a very strong dislike of that. But what I find the most insane about this saga was that the B20 virtual museum that was supposed to flip the art world status quo was nothing impressive. The B20 token has fallen over 99% in value since its all-time high. Despite all of this, Metacoven's sales sent headlines skyrocketing. Suddenly, NFTs were being created out of internet memes or, or anything really that was culturally relevant to the internet. From the outside, all you had to know were that NFTs were revolutionary and there was a lot of money involved. You didn't even have to know that they were intrinsically tied to the world of cryptocurrencies or blockchain. A successful repackaging. Once the sale of memes and other one-off NFT sales cooled down, it became more popular to start buying into NFT projects. These contained up to thousands of NFTs inside of them, usually following a certain theme or concept. What are CryptoPunks? This is, these are the CryptoPunks. Yeah, they are 25 by 25 pixels. Yeah, they're icons <laughs> of zombies. And uh, aliens, zombies, and yeah, they all have different mohawks and glasses and beard types. And I mean, what is Cool Cats? The coolest NFTs on the blockchain. Shoot, I get a Lazy Lions NFT. Been thinking about joining this amazing community. Clone X. This project is previously known as Akira. Sneaky Vampire Syndicate. We've got pudgy penguins on the chopping block today. They're selling us something called Ebits? Just as it had been with Bitcoin and token coins, the name of the game was about hyping up projects so that you can sell it for profit later. NFTs though were cooler than your average token coin, so they had art behind them. You could show them off by replacing your social media profile picture with an NFT you purchased. More so than ever, hype and attention became an important part of growing the value of an NFT. Which brings us to the apes. One of the most significant projects created after Beeple's sale was the Bored Ape Yacht Club, otherwise shortened to just BayC. Founded by the company Yuga Labs, the project featured 10,000 different pictures of apes with this distinct bored expression on their face. The Bored Ape Yacht Club project had managed to arrive into the NFT space at just the right time, about a month after Beeple's big sale. There were a few popular people inside of the NFT space already, one of which went by the name of Jimmy McNeils, otherwise known as Jimmy E. Heath on Twitter, who shortly after finding out about the project, announces their purchase of hundreds of Bored Ape NFTs. Then another popular figure in the NFT space, Pranksy, who had around 50,000 followers at the time, tweets their own purchase of 250 Bored Apes, which later grows to 1,250. And all the time these guys are tweeting about their purchases to their followers, it starts to create this buzz inside of the crypto space. You've probably seen all over Twitter this crazy, crazy thing with apes. Just after 12 hours of its official launch, the Basie collection sold out, giving Yuga Labs an estimated $2.8 million in revenue. 
Pranksy starts selling some of his apes to NBA players who start tweeting and changing their profile pictures to those apes. In August, the popular DJ Steve Aoki tweets his own $40,000 purchase of a board ape to his millions of followers. Hashtag ape, follow ape began trending immediately. Famous digital artists, people tweeting about it and creating an artwork about it, which continued to drive up the price of board apes. You ape, me ape, a friend. One of the shadiest parts about everything that followed were the blurred lines between celebrities and influencers clearly manipulating a market to pump up the value of their NFTs and genuine posts simply just showing off their purchases. You had Justin Bieber in January of this year posting a picture of a board ape number 3001 to his 251 million followers, a purchase that was reportedly worth $1.3 million. Everyone sort of assumes that the Justin was the one that made the purchase himself, right? And he's just posting it on his Instagram. But then Twitter users started to look into the records and they find that Justin's supposed crypto wallet had received 900 Ether from another wallet address. And that wallet address was associated with an individual named Gian Piero Di Alessandro, or as many others may recognize him, Justin Bieber's business partner. And Gian Piero owned his own NFT collection called Inbetweeners, which Bieber had been promoting on social media already. In those posts, no disclaimer was made suggesting that Bieber had been paid to promote them. I just got my first NFT. Oh, you did? What was it? I threw MoonPay. In some of the announcements from celebrities about their NFT purchases, there was this constant reference to a company called MoonPay, thanking them for help with purchasing their NFTs. I got an ape too, because I saw you on the show with people and you said you got a MoonPay. Turns out, MoonPay was a company that was launched in 2019, which according to their website had one singular aim, to increase cryptocurrency adoption. So that begs the question, what is the relationship between MoonPay and the supposed celebrities and influencers there helping buy NFTs. We'll talk not once, not twice, three times I've been offered a board aid through MoonPay. And there's an NDA they try to send like each agent and shit to, you know, they want they want you to not disclose that they had purchased the agent for isn't it a little shady that you have the CEO of MoonPay, a guy called Ivan Soto Wright, who is an active participant in the NFT market, who is clearly well connected to the celebrities using his company's service, who has access to insider information and likely knows when celebrities may purchase an NFT before they do it. And surprise, surprise, people started finding out that Wright on numerous occasions has purchased NFT projects right before celebrities end up purchasing them. Prominent crypto skeptic and author David Gerard had this post on his blog. It was titled, Crypto Grifters Try to Scam Artists Again. He wrote, the NFT grift works like this. One, tell artists there's a gusher of free money. NFTs are the future. If you want to get an NFTs, you're guaranteed to make some money because it's new, it's fresh. Two, they need to buy into crypto to get the gusher of free money. Three. They become crypto advocates and make excuses for proof of work and so on. Four, a few artists really are making life-changing money from this. Five, you probably won't be one of them. It's sold to you as this amazing thing where art is digitally verified on the blockchain. And that pitch makes you think that on the blockchain, when you purchase an NFT, there's literally an entry that shows your wallet and the actual image of the NFT you purchased right there. You wanna know what is actually the case with most NFTs? There is no picture attached to the transaction. Instead, it's usually a HTTPS or IPFS link containing the stored NFT image. So what you're purchasing with most NFTs is just an entry in a database that contains a link to the image that anyone else can also access. A little misleading to call that ownership. But I guess at the end of the day, that doesn't matter when, just like ICOs, NFTs were just another speculative financial investment to throw your money into. And to do that, you had to buy into cryptocurrencies. More money funneled into the machine. In my experience of looking into crypto communities and its culture and various projects, there is this game that is being played. Some are blatant about it and others less so, but the game is this. Everyone is playing a role in promoting their project, calling it revolutionary, saying that this isn't like the others, but ultimately everyone knows that at some point 
they're going to sell. And perhaps it is because of the greater full nature of the crypto ecosystem where everyone is incentivized to keep putting money into the system and to keep pushing it while simultaneously dismissing criticism. On the surface, everything is supposed to be positive and optimistic. You have catchphrases and actions that are commonly used in cryptocurrency communities. HODL, short for hold on for dear life, which refers to holding on to your crypto assets no matter what. HODLing is seen as a good thing. Today we're gonna to be talking about the art of the whole. Wag me, short for we're all going to make it, which is used as both a greeting and an easy catchphrase to keep morale high. We're all going to make it, and I say this with passion and confidence. If you leave the market, if you give up, you will lose. That is the ultimate failure. We're still early is a sentiment often echoed in crypto communities, an encouraging message for those who are both new and old in the space, letting them know that they haven't missed out on the opportunity and further riches are on the horizon. Don't abandon hope. Is it too late to get into crypto? No, never. It's never too late. It's actually too early. It's extremely early still. Those who hold on to their crypto assets, even when there is really good reason to sell, are called diamond hands. Diamond hands is actually a requirement. Keep diamond handing, okay? A positive trait that is encouraged, whereas those who do sell are labeled paper hands. A negative trait, which is actively discouraged. The worst part about paper-handed investors is that it influences other people to grow paper on their hands. Most crypto communities are encouraged to say good morning and good night to each other every day, shortened to just a GM and GN, kind of like a regular check-in and check-out with members. Negativity is usually handled in the same way, since one group's negativity can actually devalue a project and affect everyone else's ability to make money. If there's some bad news about a particular cryptocurrency project or cryptocurrencies in general, it can be dismissed as FUD, uh, abbreviation for fear, uncertainty, and doubt. We have someone that, again, is trying to spread FUD. And I just couldn't sit idly by and let people FUD my investment and FUD the leader of my investment. Or those who criticize are told, you simply don't understand without any further elaboration. Or they're told to have fun staying poor, which is a not so subtle nod to people's true intentions within the space. Or criticism is actually spun into a good thing for the project. These are all very convenient actions to encourage when keeping someone engaged and hopeful in a crypto project is financially beneficial to everyone else. I'm actually struck by how much the general public really hates it when someone gets into NFTs and they just have an absolute adverse reaction. I see this across industries. The NFT mania did something. I think it, it grew so big and so in your face from influencers and celebrities that it started making people mad. So proud, I love being part of this community and being a voice and sharing my platform and just getting the word out there. What community? What, what are you guys talking about? You don't fucking care about this. I hate that they try to put on that they care about this. Board Ape Yacht Club NFTs, which I think are ugly, dumb, Cringe. Thank you guys for allowing me to scream about NFT cartoons. I hate this stuff. It's getting worse. Check this out. I got a board bunny. And not only is it a board bunny, but it looks like me. Look at that. Nothing makes people hate you faster than NFT shilling. If you're young and naive, just like my brother, and want to get into NFTs, you should check out board bunny. The new board bunny NFT project has now been classified as a scam. Welcome David Dober to the long list of influencers promoting scams. Further claiming the team has disappeared with six million dollars. It's great to be a part of this project. I love the designs inspired by Pokemon. It's a Pokemon knockoff. It's just like stealing money from people who are fans of Pokemon. Y'all better not miss this. They promised Pokemon partnerships uh, and it was all a lie and it ended up raking in 6.3 million dollars. For the last six months I've been working on my own NFT project. So the project is called CryptoZoo. I believe it's going to change the game. CryptoZoo, Logan Paul's newest project, are basically a bunch of stock photos from Adobe that have been poorly photoshopped. Unfungible tokens, yes. I do know what they are, but I don't really like them at all, really. I'm not really into them. Nobody seems to like NFTs. We didn't find anybody who actually had anything positive to say about them. Whenever a big celebrity or influencer would post something related to NFTs on their social media, you'd see a whole slew of people responding with, oh no, not you too. And this wasn't just limited to individuals either. Companies began getting a lot of flack for even talking about or dabbling into NFTs. In 2021, people found out what cryptocurrency actually was and they hated. It is all 
get-rich-quick schemes promoted using technology as the cover. All of it. That's what crypto is. And NFT is the latest species. I think in June, there were 1,500 computer scientists and technologists who wrote to Congress calling for more responsible regulation of crypto assets. They said the catastrophes and externalities related to blockchain technologies and crypto asset investments are the inevitable outcomes of a technology that is not built for purpose and will remain forever unsuitable as a foundation for large-scale economic activity. And so you start to wonder, like, okay, like, what's going to happen? And I know that it, it really shouldn't surprise me, but a whole new packaging had been in the works and a brand new word was taking the stage. Our mission at MoonPay is to onboard the world to Web3. I have to admit, it's a pretty convincing narrative. The first iteration of the internet, Web 1.0, was essentially the first version of the web, mostly consisting of web pages and information. There wasn't much you could actually interact with. Then came along Web 2.0, which brought access to many new features. It focused on user-generated content, social media, and more forms of participation. This version of the internet became dominated by large corporations. Web 2.0 is our current modern day version of the internet, but now, Web 3.0 is coming. It kind of just referred to a bunch of different things, but the idea was that a new version of the internet is here, where your online activity was going to be making use of blockchains and tokens to some degree or another. So in theory, the now centralized version of the internet owned by big tech would become owned now by its users. In its initial bubble, NFTs were seen as just digital art, right? Which is quite limiting. At the end of the day, NFTs are just data on a public database that can act as a receipt of ownership over whatever that data contained. You know, whether it was a coin or it was a web link to a digital piece of art. The idea was that if NFTs could prove ownership over something, then you could put anything on the blockchain. Real estate titles, medical records, university degrees, legal records. In the case of Web3, you'd have social media sites and video games all incorporating blockchain and NFTs into their business model. It didn't really matter what it was or how it would work exactly. It just became this game of insert anything here, but on the blockchain. And just like that, you've made it revolutionary. You've just recreated the entire mortgage infrastructure that already exists today. On the blockchain. But that, exactly. The yeah. blockchain in real estate is going to be pretty mainstream five to 10 years from now. You'll see solar grids, electric grids, self-driving car grids uh, that will essentially be machine run and controlled and administered by blockchain. Best use case for blockchain is healthcare. What can and can't be turned into an NFT? Ultimately, what we're talking about is the tokenization of everything. Never mind if blockchains or tokenization actually fixed the issues that it was claiming to solve in these industries. It was literally the definition of a solution in search of a problem. And then I'm, I'm lost as to like why the on the blockchain part matters besides basically what everyone means is they mean, oh, I want a public record of the transaction. Okay. I mean, people suggested that you could replace legal contracts with smart contracts, which are programs that are built on the blockchain. And that's usually accompanied with the phrase code is law. This is a smart contract and this is a legal contract. These two things aren't the same, right? You can't have law be enacted by computer code because law inherently requires third parties to assess evidence, intentions, and a bunch of other variables that you just can't outsource that to computer code, especially when that code is on the blockchain and it cannot be altered. Nicholas Weaver, a researcher and lecturer at UC Berkeley's Department for Computer Science, has this interview with Current Affairs, and he brought up what he called Weaver's Iron Law of Blockchain. When somebody says you can solve X with blockchain, they don't understand X, and you can just ignore them. So you start to wonder, right, who is behind all of this money that's coming and pouring into the crypto and Web3 space? Where is it coming from and why? Either I'm not seeing the revolutionary potential that all of this has, or this genuinely is a massive mania and bubble that is being fueled by greed and delusion. The so-called next version of the internet that's attracting big money from venture capital. Venture firm um, called Andreessen Horowitz. Have you guys heard of it? I kept seeing this venture capital name pop up. We've been in the space for a long time. Kind of a big deal running the crypto fund with more than seven billion in capital to deploy. Andreessen Horowitz, otherwise known as A16Z. They're one of the largest venture capital firms. They have a crypto fund with around 7.6 billion to be invested in crypto and Web3 startups and have been investing in crypto companies dating back to 2013. If you wanted to meet the smart money behind all of this, 
then these guys were the best place to start. They say that crypto is far more than just a financial innovation. It's social, cultural, technological. In the month of October of 2021, A16Z led a funding of $150 million towards the company that was behind Axie Infinity. A16Z general partner Ariana Simpson claimed that this was an example of where Web3 is going to revolutionize the internet. In her own words, literally, Axie embodies a new generation of games. What this means for the future of games and really the web as we know it is as big as your imagination will allow. Where do I begin? Axie Infinity was what you would call a play to earn game. It was this new genre of games appearing in the Web3 space, which as the name suggests, allows players to make money when they play the game. In the case of Axie Infinity, what you had was this game where people would breed, collect and fight with these creatures called Axies. When battling inside the game, it was possible to earn this token called SLP, which could actually be traded for real money. So what started happening? Well, people started playing the game, but instead of focusing on the fun of the game, the focus became on how to earn more SLP. How do we profit from Axie Infinity? The most expensive Axie ever sold was worth about $800,000. I've invested $13,232. To even play Axie Infinity, you had to purchase three Axie NFTs, right? And as the value of Axie NFTs started to rise, certain players wouldn't be able to afford the buy-in price. So guess what started happening? Those who had the money to buy three Axies began to lend their creatures out to players who couldn't afford it. And they were called scholars. How to set up your own scholarship program as a manager in Axie Infinity. I'll be giving out a scholarship every two weeks, so that's another six scholarships is my goal. Scholars would then play the game using their rented axes, earn SLP, and then give a cut of their earnings to their managers. My team of 12 scholars was roughly earning me $1,700 a month. $600 from my scholars. With all my current scholarships working, I'm earning about $6,000 a month. Axie Infinity, a play to earn crypto gaming juggernaut that has led people in countries like Philippines and Venezuela to make a living. These are players from the Philippines who are making a living playing Axie Infinity. Most of the scholars who couldn't afford the buy-in price, they were from developing countries, right? People who likely saw Axie Infinity not as a game of leisure, but as a means of producing income. I am here to apply scholarship on Axie Infinity. I want this scholarship because I want to earn more. I can play 6 to 12 hours a day just for playing Axie Infinity. I will treat this as a job, not just only a game. I want to help my family on their expenses and save up money for my tuition and college. So I want to be a scholar so that I can meet the needs of my family. What you ended up with was a game where players are playing in order to make money. People are basically feeding their entire villages playing our game. But the only reason that they're making money is because others are buying in to also make money. In the case of things like Axie Infinity, there actually are a bunch of innocent victims, right? I mean, when you run a pyramid scheme, unfortunately, you get a bunch of poor people in the Philippines who are poor when they start and they're just hoping to make some money, but then what happens is they actually lose money. The value of SLP, which is the token that people use to actually make money in the game, has fallen 99% since its peak, and its user base has been in decline since. Times Magazine came out with this article, and it was interviewing this guy called Samerson Orias, a line cook from the Philippines who was facing financial stress after his mother had a stroke and electricity and grocery bills were stacking up. Orias jumped into the Axie Infinity game and then exited 14 months later. He described it as boring and stressful. Arias, along with other players of the game, told Times Magazine that Axie Infinity reinforced predatory systems and gave them false hope. It's already dystopian as hell, but then to say to people that by doing this we are creating opportunity for people in the developing world, that's not just dark, that's fucking evil. Again, I find myself coming back to the same question. What is it that VC firms are seeing the potential in in this crypto space? Why do they keep pouring money into it? The overwhelming majority of tokens are securities. Yeah. But they're being dumped onto retail investors. This is being done explicitly by venture firms, I won't mention any names, who are buying into companies early, getting into tokens, and then those tokens are being listed on exchanges. The public is buying into them in order to get a financial gain. They have no interest in using those tokens for any utility. VC firms have a commonly used strategy. 
they invest in a bunch of startups. Most of those startups will fail, a few will succeed, and with the ones that succeed, a VC needs to decide on an exit strategy, an event that allows them to liquidate their position in a company and essentially make money. This is a process that can take years. So there's a, another idea that is proposed by skeptics, that the world of crypto offers an incentive for VC firms to invest in a crypto company, receive a percentage of their tokens, and then sell those tokens to retail traders when it becomes publicly available, all achievable within months, highly profitable, and fairly unregulated. With crypto tokens, they can cash out in a few months. And the way that this actually works is they encourage their fundees to basically issue unregistered securities. Anderson Horowitz invested in a bunch of startups that all issued tokens that all got dumped on retail, including Anderson Horowitz dumping a lot of them on retail. This is blatant securities fraud, but they didn't commit the securities fraud. It was just the companies they invested in. On the surface, Web3 has this narrative, which is all about taking money out of the hands of the rich and the big tech and giving it back to the users. But A16Z is the exact same company that has funded some of the biggest Web2 companies like Facebook and Twitter. I'm sure that there are many inside of these firms that you know really believe in the potential of Web3 or crypto or blockchains or whatever buzzword you wanna use but it becomes increasingly harder to see that as anything other than hyper-optimism, or another word for it, delusion. There's this interview with Mark Andreessen, right, who's the co-founder of Andreessen Horowitz, and he's on this podcast episode with an economist and blogger called Tyler Cohen, and he proposes the idea for podcasts to make use of Web3. A well-known podcast host, how does that person get paid in a better way through Web3.0? Make that more concrete for us. Now, Mark Andreessen is someone that, by all accounts, should have a good answer to this question. But instead, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, they they pick they can pick their business model. I mean, they can pick their business model. They can decide you know subscription based business model. You know, micro micro transactions. They can pick you know they can pick whatever model they want. Um, you know, they can also have indirect. You know, there's this whole this whole new rise of this kind of the the, the non fungible token. You know, when pressed to give an actual use case. What you get is an answer with all the right buzzwords and phrases, but little actual substance. I compare it to the internet. Like in all seriousness, I compare it to the internet, which is the internet basically- It's 93 or so. Yeah, it's like yeah. 93, 94. This like, is it's the, the, only, the only time I've ever said this is like the internet is, is this. A16Z uses the same narrative that a lot of crypto enthusiasts will also use. You may hate it, you may think it's a fad, but crypto and Web 3.0 are just like the internet. Even I made this comparison when I looked at the entire space in a more favorable light. Now though, I just think it's another form of smoke and mirrors. It is the biggest technology shift since the internet. The blockchain, the consumer blockchain is the biggest new thing since the internet itself. Bitcoin began in 2009. Arguably blockchain technology and the foundations for it began even earlier than that. It's been 13 years since this story began with Bitcoin. 13 years to find a solid use case, or at least one that justifies the hype and is already better than an existing system. Crypto and Web3 is really great at one thing, which is trading and speculation. And there is absolutely no democratization of anything. There's centralization of exchanges, centralization of miners, centralization of crypto wealth is the most concentrated amount of centralized wealth in the history of humanity. Worse than right, we see. Okay. Worse so than Wall do Street. It. Let's it's do all so bullshit. 13 years after 1983, which is considered to be the birth of the internet, we were already seeing very clear cut use cases. Even in those early days, people could get weather reports, they could check the news, they could send emails, and many other uses that we still use to this day. I sent a message to my doctor asking for a repeat prescription, and um, he said he's left the prescription for me in the chemist. By even making the comparison to one of the biggest revolutions in information and communication is already assuming that cryptocurrencies are revolutionary and they're bound to find mass adoption at some point when that is the very future we're putting into question. One recent post that I remember on the Bitcoin subreddit was titled, does anyone else feel like Bitcoin is their literal last ditch effort to become wealthy in their lifetime? I don't imagine that this is the only person in the crypto space that is thinking that way. The crypto machine has continued running. New packaging of ideas, more money funneled into the system and a constant search to find a use case that justifies the hype and the claims of revolutionary technology. If the critics are right, then 
what we're looking at is a ticking time bomb. If the critics are right, then this is a scheme that will leave tons of regular individuals left holding their bags, wondering how this managed to happen. It already has. A scheme that managed to infiltrate the realm of media and entertainment, that managed to make use of social media's ability to spread this fear of missing out, that capitalized on greed and a get-rich-quick mentality. If the critics are right, then I suppose there's only one question that remains. At what point does the ticking time bomb go off?